also says he remembers telling then 9-11 Commission staff at a meeting in Afghanistan about Atta and what the intelligence unit found back in 2000. And he was surprised that it did not show up in the Commission's report. I'm told confidently uh, by the person who did move the material over that the 9-11 Commission received two briefcase-sized containers of documents. I can tell you for a fact that would not be one one twentieth of the information that, that Able Danger consisted of during the time we spent. A 9-11 Commission spokesman said nothing they got from the Pentagon in early 2004 backed up Schaefer's claim, quote, none of the documents turned over to the Commission mentioned Mohammed Atta or any of the other future hijackers. Where is it? Where is the beef? Where is the substance? Where is this mysterious chart that purportedly says that Atta was connected in some real way to these other hijackers? We'd love to see it. The company responsible for the chart Orion Scientific Systems would claim that only two charts were produced and that Ada was not present on either one. Throw them all out, John. These are all the charts. Spread them out. These are all Orion produced charts. These charts were all done by the data mining efforts. So the Orion Corporation lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee staff. All data mining efforts. And yet the company said to the Senate Judiciary staff, we don't have any of those charts. They're not ours. Well, here they are. And their logos are on each one of them. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, at least two of the five people that were going to appear today were threatened with removal of their security clearances if they continue to talk about this. This is going to be liberty to identify who those two are. Uh, I will to you. I'd rather do it privately since the Defense Department has chosen not to allow anyone to testify, but I will provide that information to the committee. For the life of me, I don't understand why, uh, as I understand it, I stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I understand the witnesses we assumed we were going to get to hear from from the Defense Department have been pulled. They may be or may not be in the room, but have been instructed that they cannot testify. Um, I think that's a big mistake. This is actually a chart of Al-Qaeda and the various cells around the world. Much of this data, most of it, was obtained prior to 9-11 by the work of Able Danger. Uh, as you see, there is an actual photograph what of Muhammad does that, What does that depict, generally? It depicts the uh, organizational and activity associations of Al-Qaeda operatives that were involved in 9-11 and related events. And at the time, if the Commission had looked into this in early 2004, the charts that had Muhammad Atta on it still existed. There was a chart in Mr. Smith's office. There was the chart that still should have been in the Defense Intelligence Agency because it wasn't destroyed uh, within Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer's files until the spring of 2004. The same with the chart that Mr. Smith had. Uh, our support to Able Danger became severely restricted and ultimately shut down due to intelligence oversight concerns. I was supported vigorously by both the LIWA and the INSCOM chain of commands uh, and we actively worked to overcome this shutdown for the next several months. In the midst of this shutdown, I, along with one of my analysts, Chief, uh, Chief Warrant Officer 3 Terry Stevens, were forced to destroy all data, charts, and other analytical products that we had not already passed on to SOCOM related to able danger. Another former DOD official will testify today that he was ordered to destroy up to 2.5 terabytes of data. Now, I don't know what a terabyte of data is, so we contacted the Library of Congress. It's equal to one-fourth of all the entire written collection that the Library of Congress maintains. Uh, are you in a position to uh, evaluate the credibility of uh, Captain Philpott, Colonel Schaefer, uh, Mr. Westfall, Mr. Pricer, Mr. J.D. Smith, as to their... Uh they saw Muhammad Atta on a chart? Uh, yes, sir. I believe them uh, ex implicitly. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, who was the first member of Able Danger to go public, has now been told in writing by the Defense Intelligence Agency that he can't speak to members of Congress or their staff without prior approval. And now a security clearance, which allowed him to deal with classified information, has been pulled. The congressman says Schaefer has been gagged, punished, for speaking up. The official response to Able Danger began in September 2005 with a letter from 9-11 Commissioner Slade Gordon to Senator Arlen Specter. Gordon concludes by saying that since Condoleezza Rice, President Bush, and the White House denied that Able Danger identified the 9-11 hijackers, it never happened. A six-month investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded in December 2006 that Able Danger did not identify Muhammad Atta or any other 9-11 hijacker. Can we be certain that the hijackers were radical Muslims on a suicide mission? Or is there a possibility that they were trained, funded, and protected in our own country? 
Sergeant Yes, ma'am, Sergeant Vorda. Yes. Just letting you know for information, we're having an exercise, SF exercise. We're having a calm out. Okay. Got it. Happy, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you. Between September 2000 and June 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, would scramble fighter jets to intercept errant aircraft 67 times. Interceptions are routine and usually occur within 10 minutes of a sign of trouble, such as permanently losing radio contact and transponder signal or flying off course. On the morning of September 11th, according to official accounts, four commercial airliners would be off course and out of communication, and not one of them would be intercepted. How is it that on four separate occasions, on one day, that a trillion dollar military and intelligence infrastructure could fail? Never did in anybody's thought process about how to protect America did we ever think that uh, the evildoers would fly not one, but four commercial aircraft into precious U.S. targets. Never. I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. The idea was to check response times to launch fighter jets, but according to the Pentagon email, the plan was ultimately rejected by senior Pentagon officials as too unrealistic. Still to come are questions, big questions, about NORAD's response on the day of the attack. Why, despite all the exercises and the planning, Peter, jet fighters were not in place anywhere near New York or Washington. It's been an amazing story. Many thanks, Brian. Brian Ross. One drill, called Amalgam Virgo, was conducted on June 1st and 2nd, 2001, and simulated successful terrorist attacks. Its purpose was to focus on unconventional threats, including an airborne hijacking. One plan would simulate the hijacking of a commercial airliner, which would be crashed into the capital. The second part of the exercise, which was planned but not executed, would be two planes with actual pilots on the flight deck. FBI agents would hijack the planes and divert them to secure locations. And on its cover, Osama bin Laden. In fact, multiple war games were underway on 9-11 itself. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the uh, secretary so had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. The answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. In fact, uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe, I believe he told them that it enhanced our ability to respond. There were two CPXs. There was one Department of Justice exercise that didn't have anything to do with the, the other three, and there was an actual operation ongoing because there was some Russian bomber activity up near Alaska. So. Did the war games ultimately help or hinder our response? September 11th was day two of Vigilant Guardian, an exercise staged by the Joint Chiefs and NORAD, which simulated hijacked planes in the northeastern United States. Vigilant Guardian is a branch of Global Guardian, a mass Armageddon exercise being conducted at Offutt Air Force Base in cooperation with NORAD. Originally scheduled to take place in late October, 
Global Guardian was moved to September. The exercise is reportedly cancelled after the second Twin Tower is hit. Three E-4B Doomsday planes remain airborne. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft. They say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. The E-4B is a state-of-the-art flying command post, built and equipped for one reason, to keep the government running no matter what even in the event of a nuclear war. Ask the Pentagon, and it insists this is not a military aircraft, and there is no mention of it in the official report of the 9-11 Commission. The Pentagon, the Secret Service, and the FAA all say they, at least for public consumption, have no explanation of the giant plane over the president's house, just as the smoke began to rise across the river at the Pentagon. Barksdale Air Force Base also participated in Global Guardian. Instead of returning directly to Washington, D.C., President Bush would fly to both Barksdale and off at Air Force Base before returning to the White House. Another drill, Northern Vigilance, moved fighter jets to Canada and Alaska to monitor a fleet of Russian MiGs on a training mission. Northern Vigilance also placed inputs onto military radar screens, also referred to as Phantoms, Inputs are simulated air aircraft, which appear real to those participating in the exercise. We fought many Phantoms that day. Three F-16s from Andrews Air Force Base, located 15 miles from the Pentagon, are flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina. Fort Belvoir, an Army base 10 miles south of the Pentagon, intended to test security in case of a terrorist attack. Employees in the Office of Emergency Management on the 23rd floor of World Trade Center Building 7 continue preparations for Tripod, a biological attack drill scheduled for September 12th. Finally, the National Reconnaissance Office in Virginia begins a drill at 8.45 conducted by a team from the CIA in which a plane crashes into their building. Also, a number of war games were being conducted that have yet to be fully disclosed. Commissioner Gorelick. Uh, could, could you please be quiet? We have only a few minutes with General Myers. I'd like to ask a question. General Myers, the... Um, I'm sorry. I, I would ask, please, people in the audience to be quiet if you want to stay here. Minutes. So, sir, sir, I... Has not my questions. I'm walking out. It's a farce. I will. So let me get this straight. On the morning of 9-11, the United States is running drills in which hijacked aircraft go in and out of radar. Fighter jets are flown out of the United States, and planes are crashed into buildings. What a coincidence. And in terms of what motivated me to bring all the aircraft down, as you see one thing happen, and that's an accident. When you see two of the same thing occur, it's a pattern. But when you see three of the same thing occur, it's a program. And so at that point, I decided to bring all the aircraft down. And so, at 9.45, all airborne planes were forced to land. This order applied to all civilian aircraft Certain military planes were allowed to remain airborne. By 12.16 that afternoon, the FAA managed to ground over 4,000 planes without incident. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon, uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. I'm from where? Got down to the plane is 10 miles out. The young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary?
Pentagon authorities will deny that the building had anti-aircraft defense. The FBI arrives within minutes, and the site is declared a federal crime scene, becoming their exclusive responsibility. With the help of civilians, they combed the Pentagon lawn for debris, and within 24 hours, they had confiscated every known video of the attack. Pentagon officials initially denied that any of their cameras captured the event. However, on March 7, 2002, five images taken by a security camera from across the heliport are released. For years, these five frames were the only public footage of the Pentagon attack. This would change on October 14, 2004, when Scott Bingham would file a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit requesting videotapes that captured the impact of Flight 77. Special Agent Jacqueline McGuire of the FBI located a CD-ROM that contains copies of two time-lapse recordings made by security cameras, released on March 16, 2006. A video taken from the Sitco gas station, which is open only to Pentagon employees, released on September 15, 2006. And the Doubletree Hotel in Arlington, Virginia, released on December 7, 2006. Agent McGuire concluded that the FBI possessed 85 videotapes that might be potentially responsible. As of this date, we have no clear images of what happened at the Pentagon on the morning of 9 11. Never will. The official story goes as such American Airlines Flight 77 was taken over by five hijackers led by Hani Hanjour. Hanjour entered the United States in 1996 to become a professional airline pilot. He would not complete a single course. Kind of a waste of time. He didn't show up for uh, flights on time, didn't do his homework. Boeing 757 would be crashed into the very section of the Pentagon he used to work in. 
very imminent things could happen, so uh, we look at each other, and it really, uh, the noise is un unbearable. And at the last moment, my brother uh, dumped out the uh, office. We, I heard about the uh, very big jet sound, looks like uh, just up to here. I just look at the outside, big black wings coming that way. And then I just running out, and then, you know, two, three seconds, boom! We're used to seeing planes. Maybe a 20 passenger corporate jet, no markings on the sides. I saw a plane going down, big plane, commercial liner type. And I saw this jet coming in, and it was really low. And, and uh, it was an American Airlines jet. You could read the AA on the side, silver fuselage. This particular plane was awful low, and as we were coming down on a 395, it came across the front of us, and it was low. Coming in at a shallow angle, like it was landing right into the side of the Pentagon. It just, just happened. It was really amazing. Huge explosion. So you actually saw the plane impact the side of the building? Yes, I did. Just one plane? Just one plane. I basically made a turn too early and ended up right in front of the Pentagon on Route 27, which goes, I didn't even know it was the Pentagon. I've grown up, I've grown up uh, in this area, uh, but I just never over there besides you can't really tell it's five sided anyway so i never i didn't even know it was the pentagon so but i was in traffic my main focus was that i was late for the service and we were stuck in totally standstill traffic just sitting dead still oh, on the highway messaging. and basically without warning there was just the sensation of something coming over the top of us it seems the plane was so low that it hit a light pole uh, that was uh, just uh, on the edge of the highway on the far side there um, before it came over the highway it clipped this pole which I heard ended up being knocked over and hitting a taxi in my car. Okay, my name is Lloyd Ingram. 9-11 I was driving my car on my way home. This airplane flew over the top of my car. It was real close. Something with glass and loud, a loud noise happened and the pole came through the dashboard right through the car. I, I stopped the car in the, in the middle of the street. It didn't stop straight, it stopped at an angle. As, as far as the plane went through, it didn't come back in until I stopped the car and got out. Then I looked for the plane. There was no plane, but it was quiet. If had nobody seemed to have indicated where, where something happened, I wouldn't have known. And I was there. I mean, I'm there, and, and, and the, the plane, the, the wing spread would have been from, from that house, maybe halfway in my house, and the big wing, the big motors underneath of them, and nothing was left out. Four zero seven three eight seven six six M.
Thank you. 